Well, good morning. So good to see all of you this morning, and uh, all of you are online. We welcome you as well. Um, welcome to week one of the life of Jesus. And as Grace said, we started a devotional based on this book called The Life of Jesus, Harmonized Gospel. Started the devotion last week. We, as we look online, there's more people logged on than ever before, which we expected. We've given away over 300 books. But uh, we know a lot of you are doing it on your own or watching later as well. And uh, let me just ask you, has it been good so far for you? And uh, I, I know we've really enjoyed it as a staff. And then we had our Holy Spirit Encounter Monday, and uh, that was powerful as well. Just so good. You know, last week we said that in 2022 we went deep, but in 2023 our calling is to go deeper still. And so that's what we're doing. And how many of you feel like an, an atmosphere shift? That as we're going into a deeper place that, that is personally affecting you. I'm not asking you to get caught up in the emotional thing. It's just, is that happening for you? Are you feeling that? Well, you, you've heard the expression, uh, new levels, new devils. And uh, how many of you know it gets opposed? And we're going to talk about that a, a little bit as we go on. I want to show you from last week a little graph that I showed you. And uh, these circles represent... Uh, the human soul. And so there's the, or, or really who we are. And so the shallows represent the things in life that ultimately really don't matter. Um, surfing on the net, small talk, um, Netflix, uh, any number of entertainment, just watching uh, sports, etc. right? Things that don't matter. Midlands represent things that do matter, um, these are the things, in fact, that can keep us awake at night. These are the things that we worry about. These are the things like the diagnosis or the divorce papers or any other number of things. But the problem with both of those areas is, is they're not where God is. God is in the deep. And what I told you last week is that as we start swimming out at this place in our soul, because how many of you know we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as we go to connect with God at a soul level in the deep, it's almost a natural instinct to want to swim back into the shallows because things get a little rocky, things get a little bumpy, things get a little wavy. And our natural tendency, because our brains are just wired for survival, is to go to the safe place. And we said, look, we're not going to do that. We're going to push through this year. Come on, how many of you are pushing through? Uh, and I'm going to tell you, I, I, I don't know if anyone's experiencing what I'm experiencing, but... Uh, Sometimes as you get into the deep, uh, hell breaks loose quite literally. And so I'm going to talk to you about something right now because I really feel like the Lord would have me talk to you about it. I didn't initially plan to do this in this message. And this is going to mess with some of your paradigms. Depending on how you see the world, this is going to mess with the way that you see things. But there's a reality to face, and it's this, that the world that we live in is not as real as the world that we can't see. The world we can see is the physical. Um, these bodies, how many of you know, these are going to go away. These aren't living forever, but the soul, the spiritual realm is going to go on forever. In other words, there's an eternal uh, uh, area and there's a temporary area. Right now we're in the temporary area, but the eternal one is more real than the one that we're in. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? This is what you need to know. The enemy was rendered powerless at the cross. Come on, absolutely powerless. He was stripped of all authority. So what he does is he uses three primary weapons against us. They're the same ones that he's been using for thousands of years because they work. And they are as follows, accusation, deception, and intimidation. And I got to tell you, this week, I'll be honest with you, I was prepared for spiritual attack. I wasn't prepared for how, how real it got, how quickly it got. Over the last month, I've been dealing with a situation. I'm going to be pretty vague this morning because it affects other people. No one from this church, but it affects other people. I will share from the victory side when God answers. I will tell you all about it. But in the meantime, I believe wisdom would, would dictate that I just be kind of general. But something happened about a month ago, and it had somewhat of an avalanche effect because this happened. Something else happened a couple of weeks later. This week, I found out something else is getting ready to happen too. And it got to the point where if I'm honest with you, it just got to the point where, wow, this, is, this, this, this can't be stopped. 
And for a moment, I just got bound in fear. But the accusations, what started first. And so the thoughts in my head were, Barry, you deserve this. Um, man, you are just such a poor leader and, and just such a poor father and a poor husband and, and just poor, 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 poor. And, and I got caught up in it to the point where I was just overwhelmed. Like, I suck. I don't know if I should be pastoring. I don't even know. Cheryl deserves someone better. It was just, you know what I mean? Sometimes it just gets to the point where we're, we're not even making sense. We're just believing crazy things. And uh, through some words from people in the church who had no idea what was going on, just speaking into my life, sending me texts, calling me, um, I got the word from the Lord I needed. And, and, and I was like, okay, that's a lie. Cheryl got a word from the Lord for us. And Because and, how many of you know when you're in that place, you can't even hear from God? You got to be quiet. And my spirit wasn't quiet. So I overcame the accusation, but then came the deception. Like, this has gone too far to the point where even God can't fix it. I felt like Mary and Martha did, right? Their brother had been dead for three days. Jesus shows up. They both say to him separately, Lord, if you were here, our brother would be alive, which was true. But come on, how many of you know they hadn't counted on a resurrection? And so Friday was this day where I was just still dealing with deception. And before I went to bed, man, the power of God just came up on me and said, you're believing lies, Barry. This is not true. God can fix any situation. He can make it better than before, even though that seems impossible to me. Come on, how many of you know God can do that? Yeah. And so this is what happened. This is what happened. I hit the lights and I was planning on climbing in bed and I felt like the Lord was saying, get on your knees. And I got on my knees and I leaned over my bed and I just began to repent. God, I've been operating not in, not in faith, but I've been operating in fear and in worry and doubt and I'm not gonna put up with it anymore. And the bed shook. So I figured it's dark, I can't see, but we got dogs and they'll hide under the bed. And then when you go to get in bed, you don't know they're there and they jump on the bed and scare the daylights out of you. I thought that's what happened. So I turn on the lights and there's no dogs. And I'm looking everywhere. I can't find the dogs. I go out to Cheryl. Dogs are with her. So I thought, okay, that's crazy. I don't know if we just had an earthquake. Did you feel a shaking? She didn't feel a shaking. And I go back and I get into bed and I just continue laying in, in bed, just praying like, like I had been praying. And in the power of God, I could just feel it. And, and all I can tell you is there's just a, a, a presence that came into the room and went across my legs. And I've experienced this before, but this was as powerful as I'd ever experienced it. And with it brought confusion. Now look, if you told me something like this, a demonic presence was messing with you, I know exactly what to do. But it was like I couldn't think. And I'm just praying, but trying to take authority. But how many know the enemy knows if you really have authority or not? And so when it's like, enemy, you got to leave in the name of Jesus. He's not afraid of that. You got to take real authority. And I just couldn't get there. So all I could think of to do was to worship. So I put on a worship song and it played and, and it didn't move. In fact, it started crawling up on my body. And I said, okay, we're going to pick another song. So I picked another song. The same thing happened. And I know the enemy doesn't like pray, so I don't understand this. And, but again, I'm in this confused state. So I said, okay, Lord, it's on shuffle. So you pick the next song. And the next song came on and it was Gateway Church, Kerry Job, oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus sets me free. Oh, the blood of Jesus covers me. And I'm like, that's it. Got to plead the blood of Jesus, which is what I would have told you in this circumstance. And we just began to call out and take authority. I am covered by the blood of Jesus. And, and that just the room just cleared, church. And we took authority in our house. And the reason that I'm sharing that with you is because I believe that there's some of you have been experiencing the same kind of things. And whether you believe in that kind of thing or not, I, I'm telling you that the battle is real. And you know what I had to do after that? I had to repent because I said, you know what? I haven't come under attack like that in a long time. And you know why? You don't come under attack because you're not a threat. And I said, God, forgive me. And uh, I mean, if you know, I've been holding on to the hope of Jesus ever since. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Before we get to that, I want to pray. Father, I just uh, lift up the church today, everybody here, God, everybody watching online. I plead the G blood of Jesus over each and every person, God, each and every situation, God. I just uh, feel like somebody's been given divorce papers, but, and it looks like it's over, but God, it's not over. Somebody's been given a diagnosis, God, but, but it's not over till you say, 
it's over. I really just felt during worship that somebody is seeing layoffs happen at their job. And, and God wants you to know that that situation is going to be okay. Now, I don't know, even know what that means. It could mean they will bypass you or it could mean they'll let you go and God has something better for you. But either way, your situation is going to be okay. And the church said, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to get into the word. We're looking at the first seven days. We're going from the life of Jesus, and uh, we're talking about Jesus, our hope. That's what stood out to me this week is, is he is our hope. Paul describes Jesus as our hope in the book of 1 Timothy. In Titus chapter 2, he calls him our blessed hope. And my favorite in Colossians 1, he calls him the hope of glory. Come on, how many of you know it, it, hope is oxygen for the soul? Look, you can't live without hope. That's basically the cause of every suicide, maybe short of some mental illness stuff. It's just a person lost hope. They lost hope. I was reading through the Passion Translation, and, and, and again, we've been talking about it. It's not transliteral, so the wording is a little different than probably what you're used to. But in Luke 4, it said the people of Cabernet begged Jesus to say, and this is what he said, I must go and offer others the hope of God's kingdom. This is why I came. I love that. Another part of G uh, Luke 4, it says it's the hope-filled gospel. Not the literal translation, but how many of you know the gospel is just full of nothing but hope? Come on, Jesus is a hope dealer. That, that's what he deals in. I want you to turn to John chapter 2. I'm going to preach from the Passion Translation this morning. This is going to be a little different for me. I've never preached from this before. Um, as we've been saying, it's not transliteral. Um, the idea is that it helps to extrapolate meaning, much like, like the message and the living Bible. And so if you know the Word of God, I think this is just such a wonderful study tool um, because you see how the wording's different, you know the truth, and then it helps you to, to like pull out some things that you might not have seen otherwise. Um, but if you don't know the Word of God, and it sounds a little funny to you, what I recommend is you get a transliteral translation, either a hard copy Bible or probably better Bible gateway on your smartphone or, or your computer, and go to a transliteral translation and check it like the Bereans, make sure that it's lining up so you actually see it. So translations like that, King James, New King James, NASB, ESV, to name a few. So I'm going to read through this, and I'll stop where... You know, they really got it right, and, and I'll stop where I think, you know, that, that what they did kind of distorts from the meaning. And again, I think as long as we know the Word of God, we're all good with this. So I'm going to read the first 11 verses of chapter 2. This is the wedding at Cana. And it says, Now on the third day there was a wedding feast in the Galilean village of Cana. And the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples were all invited to the banquet, but with so many guests... In attendance, they ran out of wine. And when Mary realized it, she came to him and asked, they have no wine. Can't you do something about it? Now, she didn't really say that. She said, they have no wine. It was insinuated that she wanted Jesus to do something about it because we see that in his response. He says, literally, woman, what does my, your concern have to do with me? My time has not yet come. Now, this is where the, the, the Passion Translation is so helpful because they extrapolate it like this. Jesus replied, my dear one, you don't understand that if I do this, it won't change anything but for you, but it'll change everything for me. My hour of unveiling my power has not yet come. And that's exactly what was happening. If Jesus says yes to this request, if he does this miracle, guess what? He's not in obscurity anymore. Jesus is in the front, forefront of everyone's mind. Everybody's going to want healing. Everybody's going to be chasing him down and the persecution is going to begin. And that's exactly what happened. It says, Mary then went to the servers and told them, whatever Jesus tells you to do, make sure that you do it. By the way, I know this is a little bit different than what we got on the screen. I'm reading from um, second edition of the Passion. I think that's the third, and I didn't realize it till yesterday. Goes on, says, There were six stone water pots standing nearby. They were meant to be used for the Jew Jewish washing rituals. Each one held 20 gallons or more. Jesus came to the servers and told them, Fill the pots with water right up to the very brim. Jesus just told them to fill the pots with water. They filled them to the brim on their own. That's going to be important later. 
And then he said, now fill your pitchers and take them to the master of ceremonies. And when they poured out the pitcher, their pitcher for the master of ceremonies to sample, the water became wine. And when he tasted the water that became wine, the master of ceremonies was impressed, although he didn't know where the wine had come from, but the servers knew. And he called the bridegroom over and he said to him, every host serves his best wine first until everyone has a cup or two, and then he serves the wine of poor quality. It actually literally doesn't say a cup or two. It says drink freely. The idea is they've had too much to drink. But you, my friend, you've reserved the most exquisite wine until now. The miracle in Cana was the very first of the many extraordinary miracles Jesus performed in Galilee. This was a sign revealing his glories and his, his glory and his disciples believed in him. That's interesting, isn't it? The disciples had already he had just called them. They had already left their occupation. They believed in him enough to follow him, but they didn't really understand that he was, in fact, the Messiah until they saw the miracle. Love that story. I absolutely love that story. In the U.S., typically, we have more people at the wedding than we do at the reception. I've done enough weddings. I've been to enough weddings that I know that this is true. We might have two, 300 people at, at the wedding, but it might be 150 to 200 that actually stay for the reception. Well, in India, it's opposite. We had, I had the privilege of doing my daughter's wedding in India, and we had about uh, 200 people at the wedding, but at the reception, we had over 1,000. Because that's just what people do. And so they handed out, here's the interesting thing, they only handed out 800 invites, but over 1,000 came. So this is how it works. You give invites basically to the whole village, but they can go and invite their friends and do things, and no one thinks there's a problem with this. So they actually accounted for it. They typically account for about 25% more. So they accounted for 1,000 people, but we went over 1,000 by a little bit. And so what happened was they were afraid that the food was going to run out. And so the family of Stephen, about 30 uh, extended family members said, we won't eat. Our family said, we won't eat. It was really difficult for me to give up my portion and be willing to make that sacrifice, but I did. And we just made it. But the thing of it was, as I was talking to Cassie and Stephen about it, is that if they would have run out of food, I mean, how many of you know that's not good at a wedding? But as far as I'm concerned, I would have just got up and made an announcement. Hey, those of you who are invited can eat. Those of you who are not invited can't eat. End of the story. But that's not their culture. In their culture, you feed whoever shows up. And it's a really shameful, humiliating thing to the family. And it really sets a wet towel over the beginning of their marriage. And that's just kind of the way it is culturally. It would have been terribly embarrassing for the families. Well, I want to tell you the Jewish culture was similar, is similar, but really was back in the day. Jesus and his disciples were invited, but apparently a whole lot of people who weren't invited came. And that's why they're running out of, of drink. And so uh, as in India, more people showing up wasn't unusual. But to run out of wine was a bigger deal than running out of food. Come on, how many of you ever been to a wedding with an open bar? Come on, you give somebody a protein bar, but you better keep that, that open bar running. I mean, that's the way it is. And so th this, is a, this is a big, big deal. I like how the chosen uh, dramatized this and kind of brought out some how it might have been. It shows the panicking that the servers have in the background, but they're watering down the wine. They're giving smaller portion. They're putting out rounds with, with bigger um, steps, of, uh, amount of time in between rounds. And, and I imagine that's probably what they were doing, but eventually they ran out. And here's the thing. Jesus is the only one who can do anything about it. But here's the thing, God only responds to faith. Come on, without faith, it's what? It's impossible to please God. James 1 says that, look, when you ask, ask in faith, because the person who doubts shouldn't expect anything from God. And so a kingdom principle is God is only going to respond to faith. Come on, he doesn't respond even to desperation or need. He responds to faith. This is how our God works. Here's the situation they got. There's only one person who has faith. 
It's just Mary. No one else has seen a miracle. The disciples were beginning to believe in him, but they weren't sure, and they certainly didn't know he had miracle working power. The, the people of Cana, well, that's in Galilee like Nazareth is. It's not that far. So they likely knew who he was, but that made it worse because he was common to them. This was just the carpenter's son, but Mary believed that he could do a miracle because she knew he was a miracle. His birth was a miracle. At 12 years old, he is in the temple teaching the rabbis wisdom that was supernatural beyond what anyone else understood. She knew her son was a miracle. And so she makes a faith statement. And if you're not reading carefully, you miss it. She goes to the servers and, say, and says to him, do what he says. Now that might not sound like much, but what she was saying is this. This is my son. He can fix this situation. He loves me and he's going to. So you do what he says. It's a statement of faith. Come on, how many of you know everybody wants more faith? Nobody wants to be in a situation that requires more faith. Isn't that right? Come on, everybody wants more faith. We ask for it. You know, God gives it to you. He puts it in a situation that requires more faith. Hebrews 6.19 says we have hope. This hope is Jesus, and it serves as an anchor in our soul to keep us steady and firm. I love that. He's an anchor for the soul. I was watching a show on TV this week, and there was a, a ship that was capsized in, in a storm in Australia, and they show the boat flip upside down, and a couple of people are holding to the boat, and the boat's sinking, and in comes a helicopter. The helicopter comes down and rescues them, pulls them out, and situation averted. How many of you know those people wouldn't have wanted them to drop an anchor? Come on, if I got my choice between an anchor and a helicopter, I want a helicopter. But that's not the way God always works. He's not necessarily going to pull us out of the storm. He's going to hold us firm in the storm to where we can stand. Come on, somebody needs to know God's got your back. So while we wait on our miracle, we hold on to our faith but we also do whatever he says. That's, that was the instruction. Do whatever he says. Come on, when you're in a difficult situation, if you can quiet your spirit, God will speak to it. I couldn't, but he spoke to Cheryl, and, and he gave her two words. He said, trust and wait. Trust and wait. And that's what we've been holding on to. We're still waiting, but we're still trusting. But we trust and we wait. But when he talks about do whatever he says, I thought about it. It's more than the, just, just obeying whatever word may come. We got to obey what we already know. See, this is the problem. If, if you're living in sin, if you're practicing sin, if Jesus is only requiring, is going to respond to faith, you don't have any because your conscience is testifying against you. Come on, Jesus is comfortable with sinners. He always has been. That's not the issue. The problem is he loves his children too much to leave them in sin because sin destroys. And so if we're going to be in that place and we think we can appear before God and say, God, I need you, you're not going to have the confidence to get it done. It's going to be kind of like me trying to take authority over the enemy. I, I, it's not sincere. It's not real. I'm not standing firm in it. So we do what he says, we obey, we trust, we wait. You know what else I like? We got to go the extra mile. The servers, Jesus told them to fill them. They didn't just fill them, they filled them to the brim. Come on, how many of you know the kingdom is an excellent kingdom? God's not okay with just doing things okay. We do things with excellence in the kingdom. See, part of that is, is you know what, the best thing you can do when you're in that situation is take your, take your eyes off of your problems and come on, find somebody else to pray for. How many of you have been in a situation where, man, it's just deep and then you hear of somebody got a bigger problem than you and you go pray for them and you minister to them and all of a sudden your problem just doesn't seem that big and before you know it, God took care of your problem anyway. Come on, we got to take our eyes off of what's going on in our situation. And the last thing is, look, we got to do this with other people. You are never meant to carry your burdens alone. Galatians 6 2 says, bear one another's and, uh, burdens, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? To love God and love people. How do we do that? We come alongside them and say, I have you. 
I'm praying for you. I can encourage you. I heard this awesome story just yesterday. And it was how when Nazi Germany took over Denmark, the Jews were told, like every other country that, that the Nazis occupied, they had to wear the Star of David around their arm to identify themselves. Well, at that time, uh, the Danish society was still run by a king. And so the king said, you know what, we're all Danes. And so if this is how it's going to be, then we're all Jews. And he said he went and put on the armband and he told all the sus uh, subjects in the kingdom to put on their armband as well. Come on, that's a beautiful sign of solidarity. Come on, that, that's, that's saying we got your back. If they're going to pick on one of us, come on. How many of you know when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts? And so we got to respond to that. I've gotten so much encouragement this weekend. Again, people don't even know what they were doing. They just felt led to, to, to met, reach out to me. Larry Collins, our drummer this morning, he sent me a message midweek, has no clue what's going on. He says, listen, God won't let this go. He says, you and Cheryl, I don't know what you're going through right now, but God says that you are right where he wants you. Well, right at that point was where I was in my crisis of how much I suck, and that's exactly what I needed to hear. I am where I'm supposed to be. I started examining my heart, and, and I was like, okay, if I'm where I'm supposed to be, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? And I'm like, my conscience is not testifying against me, and guess what? I'm able to find faith in that. So many people encouraged us this week. In a time of crisis, listen, it's not the ideal to find time to find community, though. I mean, we're there the best we can, but the time to find community is before the storm. So you're already established. This I know for certain, we need each other. Holy Spirit encounter, one of the really cool things is we put some mics in here and, uh, and, and people who have things on their heart feel like God's saying something could come up and speak through the mics. It, it's, it's pretty cool. Well, the thing that blesses me most is when young people take a step of faith and they come up and they're like, you know, just going for it. Well, there was this uh, girl this week, high school, and uh, you came up, and you can tell this is a step of obedience. She's not really comfortable with this. And she gets on the mic, and she says, listen, I just feel like somebody needs to know. I came in here this evening, and I was just so discouraged, so overwhelmed. And I found a group of my friends, and they prayed for me. And I was encouraged, and praise God, I'm strong in him tonight. And, and, and she just went on. And somebody needs to know that if you're struggling right now, you find some people to pray for you. Be, I just wanted to jump up and start flailing my arm. Yes! I'm thinking she needs to preach Sunday because she gets it. We're going to transition into a time of, of ministry. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to practice bearing one another's burdens. That's, that's, that's how I want to wrap this up. Because here's the thing. Um, I really sense I'm not the only one experiencing this. Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in 1947. And so to break the sound barrier, they didn't know exactly what it was. Well, it turns out it's like 698 miles per hour and change. And so what happened is in 1947, the, the planes were designed in such a way that they weren't able to withhold that much pressure very well. They're not aerodynamically designed like they are today. And so what happens is you'd hit 650, 660, 670 miles per hour, and, and you're you begin to shake. The, the plane would begin to shake so violently that, that people who tried it time and time again were determined to break right through, but they would get into the 670s, 680s, and, and they would pull back every time because they, they reasoned that the, the plane was about to erupt. It was about to blow up or it was about to fall apart, but either way, they die. Well, Chuck Yeager came along and he said, look, I'm going to do this or I'm going to die trying. It's just that simple. So he got up there and just like everybody else, it's shaking, it's shaking, it's shaking. And then guess what? He hit 699 miles per hour and it's smooth sailing just instantly. See, it turns out when you break the sound barrier, everything becomes peaceful and calm and still. Come on, there's some people in this room. You're, you're shaking. You're shaking violently. You got some things in your life. And listen, the thing I'm dealing with when I tell you about it, you're going to be like, seriously, I'm looking at this, this, or that. I know people are dealing with much more serious stuff than I am, but it doesn't matter with our God. Whatever your situation is, come on, how many of you know he has an answer? 
And there is breakthrough coming for you, but we got to hold on to our faith. We got to stand strong in him. Mary and Martha thought that Jesus was late. They hadn't accounted for a resurrection. Come on, God, God wants to resurrect some of your fear today. God wants to resurrect some dreams today. God wants to resurrect some impossible situations. And so right now, I'm talking to anybody in the house, anybody online, and there's a network that can see you just type in and and they can minister to you. But wherever you're at right now, if you say, man, that's me, I know that what I'm dealing with is not just heavy, but man, it's a supernatural attack. I know I'm under spiritual attack. If that's you, I want you to stand up right now. We want to pray for you. Online, just do that little wave your hand kind of thing. All right, this is, this is what I want to do for the rest of us. Come on, we, we are to bear one another's burdens. I want you to just, just, just pray to yourself right now. Say, God, who, who am I to surround right now? Who am I to go and pray for. And whoever that person is, I want you to just go, or that couple is, I want you to go to them right now. If they're on the other side of the room, go to the other side of the room. But whoever God's calling you to minister to, if he's calling you to minister to, I want you to go right now and lay hands on them. Now listen, those of you who are being prayed for, if you want to tell them specifically what you're dealing with, you can do that. But look, if you don't, and you just want it to be private, just raise your palms. Just raise your palms and they'll know we're coming to pray for you, but we're not going to ask any questions. We're just going to pray for you right where you're at. Come on, let's move. Let's move quickly. Let's just find somebody. Thank you, Kara, for surrounding Cheryl. Come on, I need somebody for the Middletons right here in the middle. Come on, nobody gets left alone. Nobody gets left alone. Come on, we're with each other. We've got a couple right over here on the west side. Let's come on, let's surround them right now in Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's start praying some powerful prayers. We've got somebody in the middle towards the back. Nobody's praying for them. Please, somebody, go find them. I want to do a blanket prayer. If everyone's not covered, I'm jumping down and going to go pray for myself. Pray for myself. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, if you got no one praying for you, I want you to raise your hand so we can see you. Where are you at? Everyone covered? All right, right over here we got this gentleman with his hand raised. Come on, somebody over there. Got somebody praying for Mike here. Somebody right there. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, in Jesus' name. Right now, lady in the white, someone please lay a hand on the lady in white in the back here. Come on, one of the ushers, if nobody else, but somebody get over there and just pray for this lady. Father, we just lift all of these situations up, God, spoken and unspoken. God, we do not know what's going on, but you know exactly what's going on. God, we're praying for a a miraculous release of provision, God. If it's in a a relational situation, God, I pray that you bring restoration to that situation. If it's a financial situation, God, I pray that as they walk in obedience, that God, you would provide for them. God, if it's that diagnosis and the doctors are saying, there is absolutely nothing we can do. Come on, we know there is a God in heaven who can do what they can't do. You are the great physician. You are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. God, every soul in here, even the ones maybe not standing, the ones online, God, surround them right now, Jesus, with your Holy Spirit. Just confirm to them that you are with them. And if your God is for you, who can possibly be against you? Come on, somebody. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Father, release your power. Release your confidence, God. God, raise the level of faith in this house for your glory and our benefit. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. And it's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen.